A regular meeting of the Marinwood CSD Board of Directors, Tuesday, March 13, 2021. Attention, this will be a virtual meeting of the Marinwood CSD Board of Directors pursuant to Executive Order N2920 issued by the Governor of the State of California. There will not be a public location for participating in this meeting. Any interested member of the public can participate telephonically or via internet by utilizing the web link or dial-in information printed on this agenda. At points in the meeting, when the meeting chair requests the public comment, members of the public participating in a live meeting, either via internet or telephone, shall indicate their desire to speak. If participating via internet, please click the raise hand feature located within the Zoom application screen. If connected via telephone, please dial star nine. And I guess we'll go to a call to order roll, roll call of the directors. Tiff? Yes, board president Shay. I'm here. Director Case. Here. Director Kilkenny. Here. Director Oysterman. Here. And Director Ruggieri. Here. Thanks. Cool. Okay, we're going to adopt the agenda. Are there any changes? I think you're good. Am I asking for the public? No, you just adopt it. There's no changes. All right, let's adopt it. Uh, call. Uh, we take a vote, Eric? Nope. Okay, then the. Uh, <clears throat> Let's approve the consent calendar, the draft minutes of the regular meeting of June 8th, and the bills paid. Uh, any questions and or comments? I was just um, not having a chance to look back at our old packet. Um, I was curious, did the, um, did the phone replacement, did that fall into budget, Eric? Like into the budgeted amount? Yeah, like what, you, what we expected. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And same, same with the faucet replacement? Uh, the faucet actually came in quite a bit under what we budgeted for. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank Luke. He's the one who did the legwork on the uh, faucet stuff. Cool. Uh, public comment? Any? Yeah, one second, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Steven. Okay, actually, it, I just wanted to verify my microphone was uh, working. Um, so Recording I, in progress. I'm, I'm just, uh, that's, that's all I have to say about it. I'll have a, other comments later, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, on to, oh wait, let's call for a, a, a motion. I move to approve the draft minutes of the regular board meeting of June 8th, 2021 and the bill is paid numbers 5458. Second. I second. <laughs> Tiff. Uh, board President Shea. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. Director Oysterman. Aye. And Director Ruggieri. Aye. Thanks. Okay, on to public comment, open time for items not on the agenda. <clears throat> One second, Bill.
Stephen. As was uh, mentioned before, uh, our esteemed president uh, uh, passed several milestones this year, and we re all really need to congratulate him. He's uh, made a bit, you know, uh, impressive number, and looks great. And uh, he's had success in his personal life, and his kids are on their way. And this is an important moment, and I, I do think. Um, it's just something to congratulate him for. Um, as we, uh, we're all heading down the path of, of becoming, you know, older and wiser, and um, we all have a legacy that we bring forward. And um, unfortunately, you know, due to the infirmaries of age, we're, we're all going to find ourselves in a situation where uh, mobility is a little bit more challenging. Um, the activities that we once enjoyed are not going to be there anymore. We're going to be slowing down. And um, this is a great opportunity. I would like, love to see, I've asked for this before, and it doesn't seem to ever get on the agenda, but think of ways that we can um, improve the accessibility of Marinwood Park uh, and make our programs more uh, friendly to the senior population. Easy things, I've, I'll talk, the, uh, I, I was camping in this last month and up on the coast and I was walking on accessible trail uh, and there are actually some standards that are used on accessible trails it's very easy for us to make Marinwood Park completely accessible, and I think that would be an important goal. Um, also, to provide more seating for seniors um, and accessible bathrooms, um, which are much needed not only by, you know, uh, well, they're needed by everybody for the amount that we use the park. Uh, we need more stalls available, uh, and we can put in a, a a uh, prefab unit next to the uh, tennis courts at a pretty low price. The last I checked, it was about fifty thousand dollars for a prefab unit that gets dropped in uh, off a trailer, and it's the same kind of thing that's used in the county park system. So, um, congratulations, Bill, and congratulations, <laughs> uh, uh, everybody else. Um, Let's make this a great night and uh, think about ways that we can improve as a community. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, anybody else, sir? No. Okay, on to district matters. Ah, the district manager report. Oh, yeah. This is Sorry, I'm not used to being at this part so quickly here. Um, yeah, a few items of note. Uh, I have an update about the park maintenance facility that I went in there. We're still kind of awaiting final review on our permit application. Um, I've been talking to people uh, within the CDA about what some of the holdups are. Um, so hopefully we can get that clarified and, and issued quickly. Um, and again, just a, a note of, uh, of gratitude and for the patience and understanding of both our contractor, Murray Building, as well as our architect, Hansel Design. Um, if you have been behind Idleberry and now moving towards Queenstone Road, you've noticed that we do have uh, goats grazing out in our open space areas uh, right now. Um, they uh, are slowly moving down. I know they just put some of the fencing around over by Queenstone and eventually those will work their way to Peachstone. Um, the, the GOAT company is also, we've asked them to take a further assessment of accessibility and feasibility to bring the GOATs over to Grasshopper Hill, which is kind of uh, the northeastern corner of Marinwood. Um, when we, that definitely was part of the area we intended to do. Uh, and when myself and Kate Anderson, a, a vegetation specialist with uh, Santa Fe, went and looked at it, we had a, a little bit of concern about 
how feasible it really was going to be to bring goats out there when we looked at it further. So we've asked them to take a look at it and that I believe is supposed to happen tomorrow. So hopefully we'll have some updates on that. Um, and then just a couple housekeeping notes that are in here. Um, we have made a banking change for our local banking and payroll. We've opened our account at Bank of Marin. Um, that is functioning properly. Um, we've already made some of our needed EFT transactions uh, that you know pay CalPERS for things like health and pension. Uh, our first payroll will actually run through there on this Friday. Um, so I'm not thinking anything should be uh, wrong, but everything uh, until it goes, everything goes through once, it'll be nice, but that account was opened. Wells Fargo, our savings account was closed and all of those were moved to a separate savings account at Bank of Marin. And all of the funds in the checking account were drained with the exception to account for outstanding checks. Um, all of these are payroll, many are very old. We've notified uh, all of our active employees not to sit on any paychecks they may have. And by the end of uh, the first quarter um, in September, we'll be closing that account and transferring those remaining funds over as well. Um, and then just some updates on some of our capital improvement efforts um, that I've listed in here. One was already touched on really quickly. Um, probably saw it in the claims, I believe it was this month. Um, we've got all the fixtures um, in the community center bathrooms have been uh, updated to be touchless fixtures. Uh, the uh, new phone system has been installed in the community center mm -hmm. and the fire station. Uh, that was actually carried over into the current year fiscal budget, but we were able to get it done prior to the end of the fiscal year. Our phones really started to go, uh, for a lack of a technical term, pretty wonky on us. So that kind of forced our hand into we need to get it done quickly. So we were able to get that done. Uh, they're working great. They sound and perform much better. Um, we have ordered a new uh, upgraded backup generator for the fire station. We had one on back order for months and months and months through one of our primary vendors. Uh, we finally started just looking at other vendors, found one uh, at a same cost, wound up canceling the other order, purchasing that. So that should show up. Um, and as soon as we get that in, we'll be able to bring our electric vendor back out um, because we want to increase the capacity of our backup uh, operations there so that it can actually operate the bay doors. It'll be able to uh, put a little bit of power into the kitchen to keep things like the fridge and a couple outlets working, um, especially important during these, you know, longer and durated PSPS events that PG&E comes through. Um, and then I uh, also wanted to uh, really kind of give a, a very solid acknowledgement uh, to a lot of the firefighters over there, especially Jeff Smith. And I know uh, engineer Cesar Correa and fire captain Ryan Brackett uh, were very helpful as this went going, but we've ordered and are uh, working on putting in the new turnout lockers. We needed to uh, do a little bit of work uh, uh, to that area. Jeff with the background in construction has led much of the prep work. This included removing a door, installing a wall to support the turnout lockers in their new location. Um, they've installed a door to the communication center room, which does house the washer and dryer. Uh, and soon it will also be housing the turnout extractor, which we'll be getting shortly here as well. Um, the fact that these guys willingly, they weren't asked, um, they just simply did it um, and just took on this work is certainly a cost savings to the district. And it was certainly appreciated by myself uh, to have them come in and, and be able to do that. And it really looks incredibly good. It's, it's very smooth. It's very... Uh, uh, it's a very finished looking job that they've done. So again, engineer Jeff Smith, uh, but also a lot of other fighters pitched in too. So uh, a large thank you to them. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, this last month's been fairly busy just trying to get the, a lot of these projects up and rolling. Uh, so that's an update on where we are. Questions? Just have... Um... A couple of questions, I guess. Okay. One is how far up the hill are the goats grazing from, I guess, <laughs> the backyards? Uh, no more than 100 feet. All of that is kind of within what is a, a CEQA standard. Okay. So they don't go you know, far up into the hillsides. That requires a lot more study. This is simply for a defensible space. 
uh, it kind of, you know, borders the residential properties as they go along. Um, and it would be the same on Grasshopper Hill. It would mostly be just towards the bottom of the hill to kind of create that, uh, that buffer zone, so to speak. Uh, uh, Chief White might be able to speak to it better than I can, and he's certainly welcome to. Uh, but that is, uh, it's all within a 100-foot zone. Okay. Can, yeah, because I know a, a ride around Queenstown, there's not a lot of, uh, uh, would I say, dried grasses before you hit trees. Right, right. Well, and, you know, they do actually uh, uh, certainly uh, enjoy eating on some of the lower limbs on the trees and clearing out some of those leaves and things, too. So they're kind of building the canopy. They obviously can't climb up very tall. But uh, you're right. And the herders who go around and install the fences, they take all of that into account. And they're actually uh -huh. really, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I mean, they're like billy goats themselves, the way they can get up there on the hills and get that fence yeah. and the pens and everything run in there. And just the efficiency by which they do it is, is impressive. And then we're still waiting for the permit. There's, they're still not. Yes, it's been sitting in a, in a review process with one final department. Uh, all of the plans have been third party checked and approved. Planning has already approved it. Uh, nothing has changed. Um, I've, I've, I've reached out to folks within the department there to just say, we need to push this along. This has got to get going. I don't understand the delay. Help me understand the delay. Um, so I'm, ex I'm expecting this to move very quickly at this point now, hopefully, uh, yeah. relatively. Thank you. You got it. Anybody else? I guess it would be public comment. Yeah, one second, please. Yes. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so, yeah, I was uh, surprised that uh, we didn't have full approval. I thought that's what we had prior to contracting uh, with our contractor. I assume that we've already contracted for money. We've also, con you know, we've, we're in it, but we're not starting it, and this must be costing us money. And I'm a little concerned about change orders uh, already, um, and we haven't even started the process. Can you, can uh, you provide any more information other than uh, it's being delayed. Is there a problem with, say, setbacks or uh, drainage or other issues that uh, may require the revisit of the, the plan? No, there's no issues, and we've not been told of any issues. Setbacks are fine. The project has been approved as a whole. This is just the building and construction permit set. Um, which has already gone through a third party. I, I wish I could give you more information on why it's taking the county longer. We haven't had to issue any change orders. Uh, the contractor's been very understanding and patient with it. Okay. So um, the other, uh, okay. So I, I know, because I, I walk that area daily, there's a lot of concern um, about that area uh, being so massive. I know it's just during the construction phase but also uh, there's a impact to the horseshoe pit. I know uh, from comments a lot of people make, they don't like uh, walking past that area, especially on a Friday night when everyone's drinking heavily um, and, you know, horseshoes are flying. I, you know, I, I hope we, we can work a better solution where we can actually uh, gain access to that space. Um, I, I, I'm asking you just to basically take a look at that. I appreciate the fact that larger uh, uh, signs have gone up as far as people walking their bikes. It really hasn't been an issue as far as I could tell. But uh, anyhow, I'm looking forward to uh, getting this construction moving along. And, you know, hopefully at the end of this, we're going to have a, a good project and that we can all uh, at least feel some uh, good, good about, uh, feel good about. So, uh, thanks. Thank, Thank you, Stephen. Okay. On to, oh, sorry. Uh, is there anybody else there? Uh, nope. That's it. Okie dokie. Uh, fire department chief, 
Chief, your report, it's only, it's not even eight. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be with you again this evening. And um, I'll start out with the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. And really, this one's going to center and focus primarily on Zone Haven, the uh, evacuation platform that's been uh, at work for the last three or four months. Uh, effective June 28th, Zone Haven has placed their zones into the evacuation management platform and they're now available to the public. Um, so with that, everyone in the community is, is encouraged to actually sign up uh, and go to www.community.zonehaven.com for the community application access slash use of this new application. The zones are set up across the entire county and in some cases they're actually using some of the previous names of zones that were known to, to individuals and they've been subdivided in other cases. Um, there are also useful links as you get into those zones if you click on those links found within the zones. There's useful information in there. Um, just a little bit about Zone Haven. It's actually designed to reduce the reflex time for first responders to decide that an evacuation is necessary. Um, <clears throat> Very flexible tool in that it allows the sharing of information with social media and or news media sources so that if we need to broadcast information right away among different platforms, it can be done uh, very quickly and very comprehensively. Um, they said that now that there's a, an additional feature that allows residents who've been evacuated from their homes to actually access the platform to know when evacu uh, evacuated personnel are allowed back into their neighborhoods. And so that's um, a new tool. I think that's probably something they developed after seeing the evacuation of multiple areas, perhaps down in Santa Cruz area or some in the North uh, Sonoma County areas from last year's fires. Um, Fire Safe Marin is developing a video that's gonna contain some additional useful information. So. Periodically go to firesafemarin.org and, and check for that video. I think it's going to be coming out pretty quickly here within the next few weeks. And it could actually already be out. Uh, I haven't looked on the website in a little while myself, but there's a official launch of the application that's really going to be slated to take place next spring. But there's going to be a host of just uh, substantial campaigning to encourage everybody during the fall and early spring, or excuse me, fall, winter and early spring months to um, sign up and use this tool that is gonna be a game changer for everyone when it comes to understanding and having situational awareness and understanding what zones are being evacuated and when. So um, please take the time to go ahead and as members of the public, uh, take a look and see what's there already at this point. We'll move on to vegetation management. Uh, this year, we have 12 defensible space inspectors. Uh, I hate to say it, but we're losing one of our vegetation management specialists who just turned in his notice to leave. He's going to move on to the county to um, take on an opportunity that's going to allow him to work in the vast open spaces that the county has that we don't currently have in San Rafael or Marinwood. Um, but it's a huge opportunity for him, and, and we really had the uh, the pleasure of working with him for the last several months as he's taking on some pretty tough challenges. His name is Gavin Albertoli. Uh, and I told Gavin, if you ever need to return and we've got a vacancy, I'd, I'd hire you on the spot. But I understand that this is an opportunity for professional um, growth. But it's also an increased compensation. So as we uh, do an exit interview, I want to learn as much as I can about what attracted Gavin to that opportunity opportunity and find out whether or not there's some opportunities to secure um, individuals with his background experience and talent so that we don't lose or see an exodus of other employees who might be leaving for other opportunities that exist here within the county or elsewhere. Um, last year we had 12 defensible space, excuse me, we had several defensible space inspectors and we were down literally to about three. Uh, there was some attrition for a variety of reasons. This year we're up to 12 and it's really a group of motivated and organized and well orchestrated folks that are getting out and really getting some headway on a lot of inspections. And so as of July 6, two inspectors in particular, along with the vegetation management specialists are assigned to work specifically in Marinwood 
It's my understanding that they started on Idleberry Road. And as, as of next month's report, I'll have updated numbers for you about the total number of inspections and compliance rates that they've determined for the inspections completed in Marinwood. PG&E. Um, not a whole lot to report from PG&E, except they have an enhanced vegetation management work planned uh, as of last week. And they said the Las Gallinas line would be the only uh, enhanced vegetation management work that it was gonna be completing in Marin uh, in 2021 to date. And that's uh, along the, I don't know if you can quite tell, but it's a stretch of line that's uh, highlighted. Um, not sure, well, thankful, first of all, that they actually have decided to work on that area. Cause as you know, there's a lot of vegetation there, but I'm not sure why it's the only to date, I'm assuming it's maybe one of their higher priority areas, but they also wanted to remind personnel that rotating power outages, power outages such as the flex alerts that are being announced are not really considered um, public safety power shutdowns. In these cases, pardon me, the outages will be communicated um, a couple hours in advance. You know, try to do what they can to provide notice via social media, via the internet and other social networks. Um, including the news if possible. But uh, I know that there's been uh, some notifications and alerts by cell phone as an example. So um, in most cases, it said that they may be shutting down. They haven't actually shut down to my knowledge. But as we continue to face um, heavy power consumption during the high heat days, the likelihood that this is gonna occur sometime later this month or into August and September, I think it begins to increase. So. Just wanted to remind everybody that these are rotating power outages that usually last upwards of a couple hours at the most. And they're designed to basically balance their power availability uh, without doing a complete shutdown so that they can maintain the ability to deliver service throughout the entire grid. The new AmeriCorps team arrived from St. Louis and they're working in city open space and they're assisting homeowners with creating defensible space. And so uh, we had some housing challenges initially with them. So they spent their first few weeks at the Extended Stay America in San Rafael, which is not normally what we've done to accommodate them. We normally would look at um, some facilities that are not quite as costly. However, this was necessary based on our not being able to place them in one of the temporary structures that we had hoped to be able to stage them over near Station 55 on Point San Pedro Road. Um, but with that, they are doing excellent work and they're preparing some of the areas that they're working on for the, um, the, the goat herd, uh, excuse me, the, the herds of goats that we talked about earlier. And They'll be doing some things like limbing up trees and continue to, to you know, do a lot of weeding and removing and piling fuels uh, while they're doing their absolute best to avoid being affected by poison oak. So their efforts continue. We're really appreciative of their work. They do a phenomenal job. I know you've seen before and after photos in the past of some of the work that they've done. I'm hoping to have some photos of one of the properties we, uh, we discussed, I believe it was the month before last on Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, was it Elvia Court, 206 Elvia Court? Um, somewhere in that vicinity. And so I'm hoping that we'll have some, some progress there so that uh, we can certainly provide the assistance to those in need, but also those who um, have been a, a challenge for the neighborhoods at times for different reasons. And so um, these crews come in and do a phenomenal job. There are other things there that our staff engaged uh, the homeowner on for improvement and we'll be doing periodic follow-up to expect what we expect as, as we normally do. Chief, can I interlude for just one second? Because you, you lead to a good segue. Um, one of the things that the chief and I and his team uh, primarily have been talking about uh, that a lot of other agencies have been doing with the MWPA funds in terms of defensible space is kind of creating a for lack of a better term, a grant program that's available to local homeowners um, to help them uh, in, in need uh, of assistance in clearing out some of this space. So one of the things I've talked to uh, the chief staff about 
is, uh, you know, really now that we're in a full year trying to wrap our head around what our uh, costs are going to be in terms of a lot of these inspections and our other defensible space uh, plans, which are fairly aggressive and then trying to ballpark and uh, estimate those out so we can ascertain if we'll have additional annual funds available. And then we would come back with some level of a uh, a, a grant program, you know, with the cap dollar amount, some, you know, might be a matching. Uh, a lot of other agencies already have this in place, so it'd be easy to put it in. And, you know, it's kind of intended for lower income or senior or people who uh, just simply aren't capable of doing the work themselves, um, especially the address that Chief mentioned uh, was one that hit our radar as, uh, you know, they can really kind of use some assistance getting their property cleaned up. Uh, they back right up to open space things along those lines. So that's something that's also in the works. We're just trying to get an accurate gauge on what type of uh, funding dedicated from the MWPA source for this we might have remaining on an annual basis. Thank you very much for that, that supplemental comments. That's, that's helpful to provide some additional information that I did not include. And so um, to, to Eric's point, we are exploring how can we effectively reach more individuals throughout Marinwood and San Rafael with some grant funding, either driven by uh, the administration from MWPA or specifically from the uh, administration of our own agencies. And so we're, we're working on that moving forward. And um, I think there'll be some resolve on that probably here pretty soon because I, those questions are surfacing from other agencies as well who've established their own programs, but may actually be looking to have a centralized program that operates consistently countywide, but we'll see how that works out. Um, COVID-19, on June 15th, uh, Governor Newsom actually reopened the state. And, and then what that means in essence is those persons who are vaccinated are still required to wear masks. However, now you can probably see through any number of different venues, people not wearing masks in, in the wide open air and it feels like a return to pre-pandemic conditions. Um, they, they're encouraged, though, if you're going to be in large crowds or in a group of people, um, you know, and I don't know what the minimum number is. It could be somewhere between 12 and 20. But if you get into a point where you're in a larger crowd, they're encouraging mask use. And part of that is because you don't know who is and who is not vaccinated. Um, and part of that also, I think, stems from the fact that you've got two new variants that have surfaced, the Delta variant of COVID and the Delta Plus variant of COVID, which from what I understand, are far more uh, contagious and maybe even more aggressive than the previous uh, COVID iteration that's first surfaced. And so um, the maker of Pfizer applied for emergency use for children ages 5 to 11. And the understanding is uh, the vaccine so far seems to be 100% effective in children in that age range. And they're hoping to have the emergency approval sometime in October or early November. Uh, and I think it could very well be that they try to remove the emergency approval to just make it an approval to use um, without the emergency title behind it. And then lastly, there's an eviction moratorium that was extended until September 30th and billions of dollars are being allocated for those individuals who've been un unable to pay their rent since the onset of the pandemic. And so this is gonna be helpful to both the um, tenants and the um, the landlords for those individuals who have been unable to pay. As you know, that puts a strain on not just those who are concerned about facing eviction, but it also puts a strain on those who have to pay the mortgages for and the taxes, insurance, et cetera, et cetera, for those properties. And so it's really encouraging news that there's additional resources that are gonna be allocated to um, continue to provide much needed assistance. For Renwood stats for the month of June, uh, we had 126 emergency calls, 60% of those happened to be um, EMS related calls. We had 12 calls which were canceled and wrapped, and then we had two building fires, one cooking fire, one passenger vehicle fire, and two wildland uh, or two vegetation fires in the bottle that we responded to as well. So it's been a pretty big, busy month for uh, 58, and uh, their time is five minutes, 45 seconds. So they're doing still an excellent job of getting out the door and getting on scene quickly as always. It's very encouraging. The uh, crew also responded to assist with a community event on Sunday, June 6th. 
that uh, was held at the Marinwood Park where Carrie Groves, Emergency Medical Services Agency, Trauma, STEMI, Stroke Policy and Procedures and CQI Program Coordinator, and also Molly Wagner, a nurse from Marin Health, all assisted with um, organizing and putting on, I think, a, a pretty good community stop the bleed hands-only CPR session. There were actually two sessions that were held that morning. And there was a, a, a great turnout and it was a beautiful morning. And so uh, I think uh, Director Kilkenny can speak to that because she attended as well as uh, Rachel Kurtz, council member from San Rafael. And um, I think you saw a lot of folks learning some useful skills that day. Uh, and with that, uh, that concludes my report. If there are any questions, I stand ready to answer. Anything from the public? Yep, one second, please. Yes, hi, Chief White. Um, I uh, mentioned I was camping uh, up uh, in the uh, north coast, and uh, uh, the uh, national, the, the uh, California state parks were doing thinning, like you're describing. They were using um, mechanized means to clear the undergrowth, and I'm just wondering um, if there are any areas either in San Rafael, anywhere, uh, actually, in, in our, our neighborhood, where the, the uh, where you completed this undergrowth work. I'm, I, I think it would certainly put my mind at ease. I do support the project, but I just want to make sure that uh, uh, it's being done in an environmentally responsible manner. I know it's going to have impact, um, but uh, do you know of any area right now that you could point to or say, hey, they did it right here and this is what we're going to do? Um, you know, we had the individual from Marin County, I uh, can't remember his name for the life of me right now, uh, who actually went out with our staff, um, Kate Anderson and one other individual to kind of get a sense of where were the environmentally sensitive areas? Where are the species that we need to be mindful of as we go about removing vegetation responsibly? And as far as I know, we haven't tackled any of those areas that we know have a, a real reason to pause or hold off on until we can find um, a appropriate means of addressing a sensitive area or an ecologically sensitive area. But what we have done is we've utilized the, the AmeriCorps crews, for example, to go in and clear out accumulations and piles of vegetation that um, clearly pre present a hazard. Okay, so um, hopefully they're going to give me a little extra time there. I, I, I don't want, mean to speak over you, but I notice uh, the clock is ticking here. Um, I, I was just wondering if there's an area that you can say, hey, we did it right, and uh, go look at that area. I would need to confer with my staff just to make sure that I could uh, provide you with a specific location, if there is one. Yeah. thing, and this is from news reports, there was an accident that happened on Lucas Valley Road. I, I think a 63-year-old person on a motorcycle was struck by a deer right near, uh, well, just right up the road, right up near the, the uh, county farm there. Um, and I notice it's not in your report. Do you, do you know anything about that? Can you tell me what date that occurred? Uh, this was a couple weeks ago. I, I read it in the patch as a kind of a news flash. Um, it did okay. say crews responded. It didn't say which agency. Um, and obviously <laughs> it was a terrible thing that, that happened. Um, it sounded like there was a, a deer just ran out and just broadsided this guy on a motor scooter, probably tra traveling at 50 miles an hour. He uh, had a heart attack and didn't make it to the hospital. But uh, yeah, I have to tell you, I, I did not hear about that incident. That's very tragic, as you stated. Um, but I can certainly follow up with staff to let me know if um, that occurred during the month of June or if it occurred during the month of July. If it occurred during the month of July, chances are the information has been forwarded to Chief Senate who puts out the hotshot news. And from time to time, Chief Senate and I will share information 
and I'll share some information in our monthly reports and Chief Senate will use some variation of that same information in his hotshot release. But I'm, I've not been made aware of that specific incident. Okay, good. I look forward to, to uh, seeing more good, good work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess that's the conclusion. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Have a great night. Thank you. You as well. Good night, everyone. Good night. Okay. Uh, the date of the next fire commission meeting is August 3rd. On to park and recreation maintenance activity report. Thanks, Bill. Hello, everyone. Um, so since we last met, uh, the big news is that we are, um, into our summer programming and we just started our fifth week of summer camp and uh, which marks this is our third two week session that we just started um, and things are going extremely well. It's been great to be uh, a lot closer back to a normal summer or about 60% of our normal attendance this year. And um, it feels like a very uh, standard summer. Things are a little bit more mellow than, than an average summer, but it's, um, it's going uh, really well. And it's nice to see so many kids and staff and parents out um, enjoying the camp program. Uh, we still have a few restrictions in place uh, due to COVID-19, but a lot fewer than last year. Um, our, our camp groups are staying separate. Um, everyone, uh, staff and campers are wearing masks anytime we're indoors. Um, and we are limiting uh, some of the activities and, and facilities that only one camp group at a time are using certain things. Um, but all in all, everyone's um, following the guidelines great and things are going extremely well. Um, right now we're serving around 350 kids each day. And um, we've got kids ages three years old to entering seventh grade. And we're running 14 different day camp groups um, and a handful of um, specialty camps going on. Uh, throughout the, the weeks as well. So we're very pleased with how that's going. The staff have been great and um, everyone seems to be having a great time. And uh, as a personal note, this is my first summer having one of my kids in the summer camp program. Uh, and that's been really fun for me to, to kind of experience camp from a parent perspective, not just from the staff side. So um, I've been enjoying that as well. So um, in other news, we have a lot going on at the pool. Uh, we started out the year doing a lot of things by reservation only and um, one group using the pool at a time per the current guidelines. Uh, but as if things have uh, been less restricted and, and things guidelines have been lifted, we have tried to pivot and open up the pool as much as possible to allow for more of our community to use the pool. And um, I'm really uh, grateful to our staff who have worked really hard to, to create opportunities to, to change the schedule on a very short notice. And we've been able to add in a, a lot of hours during the week to accommodate recreation swim for people to come and drop in, which we did not originally have on the schedule. So uh, we're now offering recreation swim for drop-in bases seven days a week. And uh, we've got the water slides going and it's, it's basically uh, feels very, uh, much like a normal summer during uh, the, the, the latter part of the day uh, down at the pool. So that's been really nice. Um, and we're going to continue to open things up a little bit more as we get into August. Uh, we did uh, continue to honor all of our previously made reservations. So we've just been kind of trying to strategically fit the puzzle together to, to be able to offer all the programs. So right now we've got a uh, lap swim going on seven days a week. We are doing, uh, we're still doing some uh, top pool reservations. And then we have Recreation swim seven days a week, uh, private and semi-private swim lessons going on uh, seven days a week. We're running our guards and training program on the weekdays. And um, uh, I believe that's, that's what we have going on for now. So um, the pool has been going great and the weather has been helpful. So we're just really happy that we're getting back to our normal in the pool soon. And uh, our fall hours and schedule will be announced in the next week and um, we'll have a pretty standard fall pool schedule uh, moving into October. So um, we're excited about that. And I'm very grateful to John Paul, our new recreation supervisor, who's been handling the pool side of things very well and, and making everything happen. So um, that's been great. Uh, we are currently working on our fall schedule of classes, programs and events. 
um, trying to figure out what, what all we can do and how to, to do it and getting in back in touch with our instructors. And um, so the staff's been hard at work putting together our schedule of, of, of all of that. And we'll have our fall issue, fall winter issue of the Marinwood Review uh, out we're hoping by mid August. So um, stay tuned for that. And we'll be making more announcements. I'll be making more announcements as we um, have more of that solidified, but we're hoping to get a good schedule of um, rec programs for adults and kids and, um, and hopefully some special events coming up soon. So um, I'll let you know. On the parks maintenance side of things, uh, one of the big projects we completed this last month was um, repairing the damage to the mini park. We were, um, it took a long time for us to get the new platforms that we needed to order. There were two elevated platforms that had been damaged. And um, we did receive those in the week of June 28th or on June 28th, 29th. Staff were able to put the two new platforms in. It was a, quite a process. We had to remove several components of the playground to be able to fit them in. And um, they are different. They make them differently now. Um, they seem to be much more robust than the platforms that ended up getting broken. So we're hoping we won't have any future damage with these. They, they seem to be much, much better built. But um, staff were, were very good at figuring out how to get them in and get everything working. Um, we did find a little bit more uh, damage once we removed the old platforms. And so um, we've done a couple uh, temporary fixes uh, for a few supports and we'll be order, we've got parts order that will be um, changing out once, once we get those in hand. But that all went very well and the park is reopened and we're, we're happy about that. Um, and then staff have been um, continuing to work on just uh, keeping, trying to, <laughs> trying to keep the, the, the grounds clean and keep the turf alive and keep everything looking good uh, after the camps each day. We um, had a big uh, irrigation leak that happened late last week that um, the staff were able to, to jump on right away and get fixed um, very quickly within a couple of days. Uh, and we're dealing with 90, that was like the 90 degree heat days. And it was a, a, a bad time to be down with our irrigation. So I'm very happy that they were able to get that back up and running so quickly. And um, uh, Marco even came, came in on the weekend to, to uh, make sure that was all working okay. So our grass was getting watered this weekend. So I'm very grateful to them for working so hard on that and sweating all day Thursday and Friday to, to make that happen. Um, and we continue to work on our uh, landscaping project, the Fireman's Hill. It's, it's slow going, but we're, we're making slow progress and um, hoping to have some new plantings uh, in place within the next few weeks and um, uh, among other projects that we have going on. Um, so that is basically what I wanted to touch on. Um, please let me know if you'd like to, uh, me to elaborate or if you have any, um, any questions about any of that. I just wanted to clarify, Luke, and it's it's in your report, and maybe I just didn't hear when you were talking, but everything like lap swim, rec swim, everything like that, starting very soon is going to go to um, basically as it was in the past, drop in, um, as opposed to reservations. Oh, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I meant to mention that. Um, that's correct. So historically our lap swim hours would be um you either would have a membership for the season or you could purchase a five swim punch card to be able to use the lap hour or use the pool during the lap times um, and then recreation swim has always been uh you can have those options or also drop in for the day um, being so late in the season and having so many things unknown we have not done a membership option this year uh, but starting in august all of our pool hours uh whether it be lap swim the top pool or recreation swim everything will be available on a drop-in basis uh, so anyone can just show up during those hours and pay at the front and, and utilize the pool uh, we also are offering a five swim punch card um, for any of those hours that is just committing to five, you get a little bit of a discount, um, but we are not restricting any of the hours to uh, one group or another. So uh, finishing out the season with um, being able to drop in for everything starting, Thanks. starting August, uh, August 1st. Awesome. Thanks Luke. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Comments from the public? Second. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, thanks, Luke. So uh, I'll just uh, start with pool. Um, so you are going back to drop in for lap swimming, which is great. Um, very disappointed that uh, you can't figure out something for membership. It doesn't seem 
terribly complicated to me. You just figure out what portion of the summer is left and uh, prorate it. Um, the punch pass system for a heavy pool user like I have been in the past is much, much more expensive and I'm concerned uh, that you're not looking at ways to normalize uh, the pool program. Of course, we pay taxes for everyone's salaries and for that pool and everything else. And so we do expect that, you know, we're not going to be charged retail rates necessarily uh, to access what is basically our pool. So um, could the staff, uh, or I, I guess the board, uh, direct the staff to uh, find some solution for a partial year membership. It's not complicated. We can probably do it in about 15 minutes. Um, uh, as far as the mini park goes, um, uh, I sent a couple uh, letters to Luke and uh, uh, Eric, and uh, I did not receive a courtesy of reply and had concerns that uh, the uh, play structure was not um, was not open and then next thing I know it was open which was great I did look at the deck uh, and I inspected underneath and it does look very lightly built and suggested that additional supports uh, be placed uh, under those uh, plastic boards I, I, I don't think it's uh, robust enough for real heavy use and it's going to break again. So mark my words, it's going to break again if you don't, if you don't fix it. The good news is I think that, that both of our play structures look pretty good to me. Um, we do need to make them accessible. We have an affirmative need uh, to provide accessible swings. It's part of the law. We need to follow the law and provide accessible paths. Uh, to make this uh, available to uh, uh, mobility impaired uh, children. Um, so I would hope that, that would, uh, you, you would move that up in your priority list. Lastly, I'd like to say, you know, this uh, um, playground project, the more I think about it, the more I'm looking at uh, what the options were, which was basically replacement of, almost exact replacement of what we have there. It doesn't make sense to me to replace those units. What it does make sense to me is that we have additional recreational uh, facilities. Um, and I suggested that we uh, convert the tot pool to a splash pad, which is very popular with kids, and will encourage more use of our pool area. We could probably do it for the same amount of money than um, I'm guessing a simple splash pad we probably could do for a couple hundred thousand dollars and it would just there would be a net gain and uh, the other thing I was thinking is if we had a uh, pool slide built in the, the, the uh, into the berms and uh, maybe some additional swings and climbing structures throughout the park um, you know we can make the park nicer you know uh, so Let's not waste our money and just, you know, replacing something that really can be fixed and, and doesn't need fully to be replaced. Um, so that and, uh, you know, accessibility is, is so important. I do want to say that uh, there was a uh, small gathering of neighbors uh, on the 4th of July. They wanted to get out. Um, we were in uh, the fireman's picnic area. And actually, I was out last Saturday, and every picnic table was filled. People were making music. They were enjoying themselves. And, you know, it's just a good reminder of how wonderful our park is and, and how well used it is uh, and treasured by the community. So thank you very much. Let's maintain it well. and. Thank you, Stephen.
Okay. Is there anybody else, Eric? I... No, sir. That's it. Date of the next Park and Rec Commission meeting is July 27th. Board member items of interest, request for future agenda items. Anybody? Uh, the public? One second. <clears throat> Yeah. Yes. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, my themes actually, what I've been talking about uh, for a while is accessibility and legacy. Um, I would really, really like you to consider uh, how this park of ours can may be made more beautiful, more accessible, more meaningful for our wider community. Um, it's not, our parks are not just about summer camps. They're not just about, you know, having kids play soccer and, and uh, some people uh, uh, play tennis and, and dog walkers. It's, it's much more than that. This is a place of, of life. This is a place of community. Uh, this is a place of art. Hopefully it won't be a place of, uh, of alcohol, but I, I ask that you, um, that you consider uh, uh, in the, your next uh, meeting uh, about uh, accessibility. And also, I, would, uh, I think our, the drinking in the park has actually kind of exceeded the reasonableness. And I also would ask that you look at policies you can do to reduce the alcohol abuse uh, that occurs on a regular basis in our park. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, uh, at this time, we request public comment on closed session items. You don't have Anything? any, Bill. Nothing? No, oh, hold okay. on. Okay, it is... Hold, eight... hold on, Bill, hold on. So sorry. Steven. Yes, are you, do you hear me? Can you hear Go me? Ahead. So uh, I, I do believe that the board may be abusing uh, the closed session uh, uh, provisions. Uh, you do have to report out what actually you're doing. You can't just meet in closed session to keep your secrets hidden. Um, the public has a right to know and you have a responsibility to report the good and the bad that's happening uh, within our district. Um, Obviously, we didn't get um, information on the delays uh, prior to the board voting on a multi-million dollar project. Um, you know, what do we know? We don't know anything. You're not, you're, you know, you're not, you're, we, we live in a democracy. And what that means is you have an affirmative responsibility to report out to the community and to communicate with the community and, and solicit their input as well. So, um, you know, I can't comment on what I don't know, and I guess maybe you like it that way, but that is completely wrong. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess with that, we'll go into closed session at 8. 29. You got it. And hold on one second. Right. So, uh, good. Thank you guys. And then uh, we will go ahead and go into closed session. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.